Live all you can. It's a mistake not to. It is only when life begins to reach its conclusion that people become aware of the importance of living. People who are aware of living, of enjoying living, are like sponges. They soak up all that goes on around them. They're aware of other people, of what's being said. They're observers of their environment. Their eyes are everywhere. Man has weak instincts, and to add to his confusions, he has free will, which means that he can successfully contradict his own impulses. Man desires peace, yet is easily stimulated to war. He is capable of both tenderness and brutality. In the written history of man, however, can be found a set of operating principles that has been proven many times over to fit the nature of man and to create a climate of progress. By studying these principles, man can gain knowledge of his own nature and learn how to act in ways that benefit rather than injury. And heading the list is man's most important need, freedom. There is no evidence in history that man can prosper without the exercise of freedom. He does his best work, that is, makes the best use of his muscular and mental energy when he is free. He produces best when he is making his own plans and devising his own methods of carrying them out, with the knowledge that whatever the results may be, they are his results, and that whatever the fruit of his labor may be, they too are his. So it's clear, therefore, that the first requirement of prosperity is individual freedom of choice and action. The way most children are raised in the home and in the school is to give them a completely cockeyed picture of what life in a free society can be like. They're taught to play it safe, to avoid risks of any sort to fit in, to conform, to be one of the group, one more sheep in the herd. They're taught to tiptoe through life instead of dance and run through it. The greatest obstacle to growth and development, to learning and to improved function, or even to continued function on the level already reached, is discouragement doubt in one's own ability. Popularly held opinions are almost always wrong. The idea is seldom, how much can I do? How far can I go? It is instead, how safe can I play it? How can I get by with a passing grade? How can I keep out of trouble? And the odds are about 95 to 5, give or take a few percentage points either way, that you and I were raised in that kind of an atmosphere, one of passive submission. The way millions live in our society, they might as well be living under a communist or socialist form of government, with all decisions being made for them by a small group at the top. Consider that they see their parents and neighbors living largely parasitical lives, doing no more than they have to in order to squeak by, and that they often live in a home environment of intellectual and creative poverty, and you begin to understand why they carry from 85 to 95 percent of their true potential for achievement, joy, satisfaction, and fulfillment to the grave with them, unused and undreamed of. They tread a narrow path and live in a state of uneasy anxiety. They're taught to live that way, and they never get over it. But we can learn to think through re-education, through realizing what the opportunities are in our society today, and that we're normally functioning on a fraction of our real potential and realize that we can definitely bring more and more of the power of our minds to bear in our lives. We've all seen people filing through one half of a double door, following each other through half of the door, and waiting needlessly in line to do it. And then you've seen someone open the other half of the door and breeze through, 
Immediately, people will plunge in behind him. But it took him to think, to ask himself, I wonder why we're all going through half of that door like a bunch of stupid sheep. It was designed to handle twice the traffic, so he opens it and he goes through life like that, opening obvious doors, at least obvious to him, while others follow his lead. He'll do that in whatever field he chooses, simply because somewhere along the line, he learned to think. Problems are much the same for all of us. Successful people are simply people who've learned to solve their problems. They've learned to think. The sudden, incalculable, and puissant energy which pours up from the hidden depths is controlled by a will which serves a vision, the vision which sees in chaos the potentiality of form. With all great ideas, there was first a long collection of information for the deep well of the subconscious mind, the storage of information. Then, the vision, the great idea itself. Whether it was a sculpture, a book, a great piece of music, a painting, an idea in mechanics or architecture or business or anything. It can come in the middle of the night or while you're eating breakfast on an airplane. And then comes the will. The determination to do the work necessary, no matter how long it takes, to make the idea a thing of reality. The well, the vision, and the will. The three steps necessary for the completion of a great idea. The old battle cry of the mob is, everybody does it, why shouldn't I? And that's exactly why the person of integrity doesn't do it. Integrity is priceless and can only lead to success in the long run. You can't keep a good man down. This is a kind of daring, uh, going out in front all alone, a defiance, a challenge. He's in control of himself and his destiny. He's not afraid of himself, ashamed of himself, or discouraged by his mistakes. He makes mistakes, but takes them in stride. The psychologically healthy person is highly independent, yet enjoys people. He's free. He resists the dictates of culture when it does not agree with his point of view. The healthy person is motivated by a desire for self-actualization or growth. The mature person also has an interest in the new and the mysterious. As long as we want things and are motivated toward their achievement, we are alive, interested, motivated. The right time is the only time we've got which is now. And if we haven't learned to live now, we'll always be living on the hope that perhaps the future will be somehow better. Power is in inflicting pain and humiliation. Power is in tearing human minds to pieces and putting them together again in new shapes of your own choosing. Do you begin to see then what kind of world we are creating? It is the exact opposite of the stupid hedonistic utopias that the old reformers imagined. A world of fear and treachery and torment, a world of trampling and being trampled upon, a world which will grow not less but more merciless as it refines itself. Progress in our world will be progress toward more pain. The old civilizations claimed that they were founded on love and justice. Ours is founded upon hatred. In our world there will be no emotions except fear, rage, triumph and self-abasement. Everything else we shall destroy. Already we are breaking down the habits of thought which have survived from before the revolution. We have cut the links between child and parent and between man and man and between man and woman. No one dares trust a wife or a child or a friend any longer. In the future there will be no wives and no friends. Children will be taken from their mothers at birth as one takes eggs from a hen. The sex instinct will be eradicated. Procreation will be an annual formality like the renewal of a ration club. We shall abolish the orgasm. Our neurologists are at work upon it now. There will be no loyalty except loyalty toward the boy. There will be no love except the love of Big Brother. There will be no laughter except the laugh of triumph over a defeated enemy. There will be no art, no literature, no science. When we are omnipotent, we shall have no more need of science. There will be no distinction between beauty and ugliness. There will be no curiosity, no importance.
enjoyment of the process of life. All competing pleasures will be destroyed. But always do not forget this, Winston. Always there will be the intoxication of power. Constantly increasing and constantly growing subtler. Always at every moment there will be the thrill of victory. The sensation of trampling on an enemy who is helpless. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. you deliberately plan to be less than you are capable of being, then I warn you that you'll be unhappy for the rest of your lives. You'll be evading your own capacities, your own possibilities. Live all you can. It's a mistake not to. It doesn't so much matter what you do in particular so long as you've had your life. If you haven't had that, what have you had? <laughs> 